So when we discussed the oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin, we actually didn't mention a very important fact about that curve. So the oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin that we spoke about previously was actually the curve for hemoglobin when it is present inside red blood cells. So why is that important? Well, it turns out that if we isolate and purify the hemoglobin and then we examine the oxygen binding curve for pure hemoglobin, there will be a tremendous difference between the binding curve for the pure hemoglobin and the binding curve for that hemoglobin found inside red blood cells. So, the oxygen binding curve of hemoglobin inside red blood cells differs considerably from the pure hemoglobin curve as we can see from the following graph. So in the graph, the y-axis is the fractional saturation of hemoglobin. It ranges from 0 to 1. And the x-axis is the concentration of oxygen in the surroundings given to us in partial pressures. So basically, we have millimeters of mercury and the range is from 0 to about 100. Now, the black curve describes the oxygen binding curve for pure hemoglobin when we essentially isolate it out of the red blood cells, while the blue curve describes the binding curve of hemoglobin as it is present inside red blood cells. And notice that the blue curve is shifted to the right with respect to that black curve. The question is why? So, let's talk about Let's talk about how much of the hemoglobin actually unloads when it goes from the lungs to the exercising tissue in two cases to see the difference between these two cases. So let's begin inside the lungs. So inside the lungs, the partial pressure is about 100 millimeters of mercury. And so the X value is 100. And if, we, and if we find the corresponding Y value on these two curves, we get the same value of about 0.98. So inside the lungs, 98% of these two types of hemoglobins, the pure hemoglobin and the hemoglobin found in red blood cells, 98% of that hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. Now, what happens when we go down to our exercising tissues where the partial pressure drops to about 20 millimeters of mercury? So here is where we see that uh, tremendous difference. If we find the corresponding Y value for the black curve, the pure hemoglobin, the value is around 0.9. And that means 90% of the hemoglobin, the pure hemoglobin, will be saturated with oxygen. And so that means a difference of 98 minus 90 or 8% of that oxygen will be unloaded to the tissues. Now, if we compare it to the hemoglobin as it is present inside red blood cells, the corresponding Y value is around 0.32. So that means 98 minus 32 gives us 66%. So 66% of that hemoglobin will unload and release the oxygen into the cells found inside that exercising tissue. And this is a big difference between the pure hemoglobin case. So what that means, for some reason, the hemoglobin, when it's present inside red blood cells, the affinity for oxygen decreases. And that is precisely what allows the hemoglobin to unload so much oxygen to the tissues uh, uh, to the tissues and cells of that exercising area. So once again, in red blood cells, hemoglobin is able to unload 66% of the oxygen when going from the lungs to the exercising tissue. While if we compare the pure hemoglobin, we see that pure hemoglobin only unloads 8% of that oxygen. The question is, why is there this difference? What accounts for this difference in the first place inside the red blood cells. Why is it that inside the red blood cells, the affinity for oxygen, 
uh, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is so much lower than in the pure hemoglobin case. Well, the answer lies in this molecule here. The molecule is known as 2,3-BPG or 2,3-biphosphoglycerate. This is a naturally occurring molecule that is found inside our cells. It is an intermediate in the process of glycolysis. Now, notice one thing about this 2,3-BPG. It contains many negative charges. So we have one, two, three, four, five negative charges. And that will be very important in just a moment. So it turns out that it's the 2,3-BPG that creates this rightward shift in the oxygen binding curve. This molecule is precisely why this curve shifts to this blue curve as shown in the following diagram. So this molecule is an allosteric effector of hemoglobin. What that means is it binds onto a location that is different than where oxygen binds to and it creates some type of change in the function, in the affinity of that hemoglobin molecule for oxygen. Now, before we discuss where that molecule actually binds to, let's recall one important fact about deoxyhemoglobin. So deoxyhemoglobin exists in the T state, in the 10 state. And one fact about the T state is it's very unstable. So in the absence of the 2,3-BPG molecule, there is a pocket, there is this space that is formed at the center of the deoxyhemoglobin. And inside that space, there is electrostatic repulsion that takes place between the amino acids on the beta-1 and the beta-2 subunit. So this is the hemoglobin, this is the beta-1, beta-2, and these are the alpha subunits. And if we examine at the corners of these two beta subunits, there are these residues that carry positive charges. And these positive charges basically repel one another. And this destabilizes the T-state uh, uh, of that deoxyhemoglobin. Now, what does this actually mean physiologically? Well, if the T state is destabilized, there's only one thing that the deoxyhemoglobin molecule can do. So if this is very unstable, then that will shift the equilibrium towards the product side, where the product side is the R state. And the R state is the structure of that hemoglobin that is very likely to actually bind oxygen. So what that means physiologically, in the absence of the 2,3-BPG molecule as a result of the electrostatic repulsion that takes place inside the center of that hemoglobin that drives the hemoglobin towards the R state and it's the R state that becomes very likely to bind oxygen and that's exactly why the pure hemoglobin has a very high affinity for oxygen and that's exactly why the black curve is to the left with respect to that blue curve. Now what what happens in the presence of 2,3-BPG? Well, 2,3-BPG is a relatively small molecule that contains many negative charges. And this molecule is small enough to actually fit inside that positively charged pocket found at the center of the deoxyhemoglobin in the T-state. And by going into that pocket, the negative charges of this 2,3-PBG can interact with the positive charges of the residues found on the beta-1 and the beta-2 subunits. And if we zoom in on this interaction, so this black molecule is the 2,3-BPG, if we zoom in on this molecule, this is what we get. So this is histidine-141, lysine-82, and histidine-2. These are the three residues that contain the positive charges found on the beta-1 subunit located at the center of the hemoglobin. And these are the three residues, histidine-2, lysine-82, and histidine-143, that are found on the beta-2 subunits. So the number basically describes its position along that sequence, along the polypeptide sequence.
So all these six residues contain positive charges and those positive charges form these electrostatic interactions with the negative charges on the 2,3 BPG. And this decreases the overall net charge in this area and that stabilizes the deoxyhemoglobin and it stabilizes the T state. And by stabilizing the T state, that drives the equilibrium back towards the T state and now the T state can exist by itself without binding to that oxygen. And what that means is that basically shifts the entire curve toward the right side and it decreases the affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen because now the T uh, the T state can exist because it is not as state it is it is more stable than in the absence of that 2,3 BPG. So once again the T state of hemoglobin in its pure form is highly unstable because it contains a pocket with positive charges at the center of that tetramer where the positive charges come from these six amino acids found on these opposing beta subunits. So this instability pushes the equilibrium towards the R state, towards the right, uh, the right, uh, the right side and physiologically what this means is pure hemoglobin in the absence of 2,3 BPG would bind oxygen way too strongly with a very high affinity because it, will, it would exist predominantly in the R state. And that's precisely why the curve is found towards the uh, left side with respect to the blue curve. Because as we shift the curve towards the left side, that increases the affinity of that molecule hemoglobin towards oxygen. Now in our red blood cells we have this molecule 2,3-BPG that can bind into that pocket because it's A small enough and B it contains the negative charges and by interacting with the positive charges we decrease the overall charge in that center area and that stabilizes the T state of the deoxyhemoglobin and drives the equilibrium back towards the T state and that decreases the affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen and that shifts the entire curve towards the right side. So from this black curve to this blue curve. And so we see that inside our red blood cells we have this allosteric effector, the 2,3-BPG molecule that binds onto a location other than the heme group, so it binds towards the center and the entire purpose of it is to basically stabilize the T state, make the T state more stable and lower in energy and that drives the, the curve towards the right side decreasing the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and what that means mathematically is much more of that hemoglobin will actually be able to unload and release the oxygen towards to the cells of our exercising tissue as seen in the following calculation. So 66% compared to only 8% in the case of pure hemoglobin when we don't have the 2,3 BPG. So in the presence of 2,3-BPG, the 2,3-BPG binds to the pocket and it stabilizes the T-state. Now, when we increase the concentration of oxygen, for example, when the deoxyhemoglobin in the T-state with the 2,3-BPG returns from those tissues back to the lungs, the concentration of oxygen increases. And as the concentration of oxygen increases, the oxygen begins to slowly bind onto the heme groups of these different polypeptides in the hemoglobin molecule. And as oxygen begins to bind to the heme groups, that basically creates a conformational change. So these two dimers basically begin to rotate 50 degree, uh, 15 degrees with respect to one another and that conformational change basically collapses this inner pocket and it squeezes the 2,3 BPG molecule right out of the center of the hemoglobin. And once the 2,3 BPG is squeezed out of that pocket, that shifts our equilibrium back to the right side, the R state, and that makes the heme groups much more likely to bind oxygen. 
And that's a very important idea because when the deoxyhemoglobin returns back to the lungs, we want that hemoglobin to be able to easily bind to oxygen with a high affinity. And that's exactly what we see actually happen. So when oxygen begins to bind to the heme groups in the lungs, the center pocket collapses and that squeezes the 2,3 BPG allosteric effector out of that pocket. And this drives the hemoglobin into the relaxed state and it makes it much more likely to actually bind that oxygen. And this cycle basically repeats itself as the hemoglobin moves from the lungs to the tissues and back to the lungs.